the Leonidas Polk Memorial Carillon brings in another program from the campus of the University of the South. Many countries, many organizations and institutions have poems or songs or bits of writing which they feel express most perfectly the inward meaning of their being. Such, I am sure, must be the feeling of an Englishman when he reads the poetry of Wordsworth describing his own beloved island. Such, I am sure, must be the feeling of a native of Greece who reads the poetry of Lord Byron, the poem especially called The Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung. Well, there was once a man, William Alexander Percy, from Mississippi, who came to Sewanee as a student, and who wrote an autobiographical novel called Lanterns on the Levee. I've heard competent literary critics refer to it as a great prose poem. In that book, the ninth chapter was called simply Siwani. That chapter referred to Will Percy's experiences at, at Sewanee, where he was a student in the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm going to read to you this lovely prose poem, and I'll say, as I start it, that many who know and love the University of the South at Sewanee feel that nothing more need be written or said about this interesting educational center of the Episcopal Church located high on its mountaintop in the Cumberland Plateau. Here we give you Will Percy on Sewanee. I had been exposed, says Will Percy, to enough personalities, mellow and magnificent, to educate a hottentot in the process. I had somehow received enough formal instruction to condition me for college. Fafar and his brothers, that's his grandfather, had gone to Princeton. Father and his brothers to Sewanee, the University of the South, an Episcopal institution. Where I should go, no one knew, least of all myself, so because it was fairly near and healthy and genteel and inexpensive, father and mother drew a long sigh, set me on the train bound for Sewanee, and betook themselves to Europe with Mr. Cook on their first foreign tour. I was fifteen plus one month, says Will Percy, in short trousers, small, weakly, self-reliant, and ignorant as an egg, I had the dimmest notion of how children were born, though I knew it required a little cooperation. I had never heard of fraternities. I had never read a football score. I had never known a confidant or been in love. My instructions had been to enter the preparatory school, which was military, but I watched the grammar school boys in their dusty uniforms, and I suspected they smelled bad. I developed an antipathy to the military life, which I've never overcome, says this hero of World War I. And so, to the astonishment of the college authorities, I presented myself to them for entrance exams and passed. By no means brilliant, I studied hard, often getting up at six, to the scandal of other students, to struggle with Latin and math, and I made excellent grades. I don't know why I studied hard, but I had no shadow of a doubt it was the thing to do. English was my favorite course whether because of the huge undigested gobs of the best I'd already read or because of Dr. Henneman, it would be hard to guess. He was passionate, black-bearded, bespectacled, with an adoration for Beowulf, Chaucer, Shakespeare, a grimace for Dr. Dunn in the metaphysical school, and much more important, a capacity for furious moral tantrums in which his beard on end clear out to the ears, he would beat his desk with his fist and roar, My God, gentlemen, do something. We earnestly intended to after such a scene. And the other great course of those days was Dr. Dubose's ethics. 
He was a tiny silver saint who lived elsewhere, being more conversant with the tongues of angels than of men, sometimes sitting on the edge of his desk in his black gown, talking haltingly of Aristotle, he would suspend, wrapped in some mid-air beyond our kin, murmuring, starry heavens, followed by indefinite silence. We, with a glimpse of things, would tiptoe out of the classroom, feeling luminous, and never knowing when he returned to time and space. It was a small college in wooded mountains, its students drawn from the impoverished Episcopal gentry of the South, its boarding houses and dormitories presided over by widows of bishops and confederate generals. Great Southern names were thick, Kirby Smith, Elliot, Quintard, Polk, Gorgas, Shoup, Gaylor. The only things it wasn't rich in were worldly goods, sociology and science, a place to be hopelessly sentimental about and to unfit one for anything except a good life. Until I came to Sewanee, I'd been utterly without intimates of my own age. I'd liked children whose pleasures were my pleasures, but they had not been persons to me and had left no mark. Here I suddenly found myself a social being, among young creatures of charm and humor, more experienced than I, but friendly and fascinating. I was never generally popular, but I had more than my share of friends. I'm never surprised at people liking me. I'm always surprised if they don't. I like them. And if they don't like me, I feel they've made a mistake. They've misunderstood something. There's so much backing and filling about getting acquainted. Indirection confuses and sometimes deceives me. Probably because of my size and age and length of trouser, I was plentifully adopted. It's a long time now. Some of them have gone the journey. Others have fallen by the road and can't go on and are just waiting. And a few have won through to autumn. But then the springtime was on them, and they taught and tended me in the green woods as the centaurs did Achilles. I don't know how I ever recovered to draw my own bow. Percy Eugene, noble and beautiful like a sleepy St. Bernard. Elliot Cage, full of dance steps and song snatches. Tender and provocative and sad beneath. Paul Ellerby, who first read me Dover Beach, thereby disclosing the rosy mountain ranges of the Victorians. Harold Abrams, dark and romantic with his violin, quoting the Rubaiyat and discoursing Shaw. Parson Masterson, jostling with religion, unexpected and quaint. Sinclair Manning, a knight who met a knight's death at Montfaucon. Arthur Gray, full of iridescence discovering new paths and views in the woods and the world. U.G. Jervie, brilliant and bumptious then, brilliant and wise now, and so human, and more, many more, all with gifts they shared with me, all wastrel creditors who never collected. Peace to them, and endless gratitude. I suppose crises occurred, problems pressed, decisions had to be made, those four shining years, but for me only one altered the sunlight. Once a month, I would ride ten miles down the wretched mountain to Winchester, go to confession, hear mass, and take communion. I had been thinking. I had never stopped thinking. I was determined to be honest if it killed me. So I knelt in the, in the little Winchester church, examining my conscience and preparing for confession. How it came about did not seem sudden or dramatic or anything but sad. As I started to the confessional, confessional, I knew there was no use going. No priest could absolve me. No church could direct my life or my judgment. What most believed, I could not believe. What belief remained, there was no way of gauging yet. I only knew there was an end. I could no longer pretend to, my, to, to myself or cry, mea culpa. It was over and forever. I rode back to the leafy mountain, mournful and unregretful, knowing thenceforth I should breathe a starker and colder air, with no place to go when I was tired. I would be getting home to the mountain, but for some things there was no haven. The friendly centaurs couldn't help. From now on I would be living with my own self. 
There is no way to tell of youth or of Sawani, which is youth, directly. It must be done obliquely and by parable. I come back to the mountain often and see with a pang, however different it may be to me, it is no different. Though Eugene and Sinclair and I are forgotten, then with humility I try to blend and merge the past and the present to reach the unchanging essence. To my heart, the essence, the unbroken melodic theme sounds something like this. The college has about 300 young men or inmates as students, or students as they are sometimes called, and besides quite a number of old ladies who always were old and ladies and who never die. It's a long way away even from Chattanooga, in the middle of the woods, on top of a bastion of mountains crenellated with blue coves. It is so beautiful that people who have once been there always, one way or another, come back. For such as can detect apple green in an evening sky, it is Arcadia. Not the one that never used to be, but the one that many people always live in. Only this one can be shared. In winter there's a powder of snow, pines sag like ladies in ermine, and the other trees are glassy and given to creaking. Later Arbutus is under the dead leaves where they have drifted, but unless you look for it betimes you will find instead puffs of ghost caught under the higher trees, and that's dogwood, and puffs of the saddest color in the world that's tender to, and that's redbud which some say is pink and some purple, and some give up but simply must write a poem about. <laughs> the rest of the flowers you wouldn't believe in if I told you, so I'll tell you. Anemones and hepaticas and bloodroot that troop under the cliffs, always together, too ethereal to mix with reds and yellows or even pinks, and violets everywhere in armies. The gray and purple and blue sort you'll credit but not the tiny yellow ones with the bronze throats, nor the jackrabbit ones with royal purple ears and faces of pale lavender that stare without a bit of violet modesty. If you've seen azalea, and miscalled it wild honeysuckle probably, you still don't know what it is unless you've seen it here, with its incredible range of color from white through shell pink to deep coral. And its perfume actually dangerous, so pagan it is. After it, you'd better hunt for a calacanthus with brown petals and a little melancholy in its scent to sober you. We call our bluets innocents, for that's what they are. They troop near the iris, which when coarsened by gardens, some called fleur de lis, and others who care nothing about names, flags. Our orchids we try to make respectable by christening them lady slippers, but they still look as if they'd been designed by D.H. Lawrence, only they are rose and canary colored. After Orion has set, in other words, when the most fragile and delicate and wistful things have abandoned loveliness for fructifying, the laurel, rank and magnificent for all its tender pink, starts hanging bouquets as big as hydrangeas on its innumerable bushes. But on moonlight nights, there's no use trying to say it isn't a glory and a madness. And so the summer starts. Summer, when we are not serified enough to see flowers, even if there were any. In the fall, when our souls return, a little worse off, a little snivelly, there are foggy wisps of asters whose quality only a spider would hint at aloud. And in the streams where the iris foregathered, there are parnassia, the snowdrops only kin. Mountain folk alone have seen these virginal processions, ankle deep in water, among scarlet leaves, each holding a round green shield and carrying at the end of a spear, no thicker than a broom straw, a single pale green star. Last, chilly and inaccessible and sorrowful, in the damp of the deep woods come the gentians, sea blue and hushed. Now all these delights the Arcadians not infrequently neglect. You might stroll across the campus and quadrangles of a Sunday afternoon and guess from the emptiness and warm quiet there that they 
had gone out among the trees, flying perhaps in shadow, idly like fawns, and whistling at the sky. Some may be so unoccupied, though not fawn-like to themselves, but more, I fear, will be amiably and discreetly behind closed doors on the third floor, playing not flutes nor lyres or even saxophones, but poker. Still others will be bowed over a table, vexed to the soul with the, return, with the return of Xenophon or the fall, too long delayed, of a certain empire. A few will be off in the valley bargaining for a beverage called Mountain Dew with a splendid, virile old vixen who in that way has always earned a pleasant livelihood. Later they will have consumed their purchase to the last sprightly drop and will be bawling out deplorable ballads and pounding tables and putting crockery to uncouth noisy uses in the neighborhood of one or another of the old ladies who will appear scandalized as expected but who in the privacy of her own chamber will laugh soundlessly till her glasses fall off on her bosom and have to be wiped with a handkerchief smelling of oris root. Yet I would not have you think that the Arcadians are all or always ribald. Even those with a bacchic turn are full of grace and on occasion given to marvels. I myself have witnessed one of them in, a, in the ghastly dawn, slippered and unpantalooned, his chaplet a wet towel, sitting in the corner of his room, his feet against the wall, quite alone, reading in a loud, boomy voice, and more beautiful than chimes, Kubla Khan and the ode to a nightingale. One afternoon of thick yellow sunshine, I was audience to another who stood on an abandoned windlass with tulip trees and a vista for backdrop, reciting pentameters, which though you may never have heard, we thought too rich and cadenced for the race of men ever to forget. I can remember them even now for you. I dreamed last night of a dome of beaten gold to be a counter-glory to the sun. There shall the eagle blindly dash himself, there the first beam shall strike, and there the moon shall aim all night her argent archery. And it shall be the tryst of sundered stars, the haunt of dead and dreaming Solomon, shall send a light upon the lost in hell, and flashings upon faces without hope. And I will think in gold and dream in silver, imagine in marble and bronze conceive, till it shall dazzle pilgrim nations and stammering tribes from undiscovered lands, allure the living God out of the bliss and all the streaming seraphim from heaven. Perhaps a poet whose dear words have died should be content if once, no matter how briefly, they have made two lads in a green wood more shimmery and plumed. Nights, spring nights in special, temper and tune the Arcadian soul to very gracious tintinabulations. Three Arcadians on one occasion, I recall, sat through the setting of one constellation after another on a cliff in the tender moonlight with a breathing sea of grey and silver treetops beneath them and discussed the possibility and probability of God. One upholding the affirmative announced that he needed no proof of divinity beyond the amethyst smudge on the horns of the moon. This was countered by the fact that this purple lay not in the moon itself but in the observer's eyes. The deist, troubled, at last concluded, anyway, he'd rather be a god looking out than look out at a god. Only this was all said with humor and a glistening eagerness a sort of speech I could once fall into, but long ago. Myself, one of these mountain dwellers for four years, I have observed them off and on for thirty more. It is to be marveled at that they never change. They may not be quite the same faces or the precise bodies you met a few years back, but the alterations are irrelevant. A brown eye instead of a blue one, a nose set a little more to the left. The lining is the same. Neither from experience nor observation can I quite say what they learn in their Arcadia, though they gad about freely with books and pads. 
Indeed, many of them attempt to assume a studious air by wearing black Oxford gowns. In this they are not wholly successful, for no matter how new, the gowns always manage to be worn and torn, and insist on hanging from the supple shoulders with something of a Dionysiac abandon. Further, even the most bookish are given to pursuing their studies out under the trees. To lie under a tree on, on your back, overhead a blue and green and gold pattern meddled with by the idlest of breezes, is not, despite the admirable example of Mr. Newton, conducive to the acquisition of knowledge. Flat on your stomach and propped on both elbows, you will inevitably keel and end by doting on the tint of the far shadows, or worse, by slipping into those delightful oscillations of consciousness known as catnaps. I, therefore, cannot commend them for erudition. So it is all the more surprising that in after years the world esteems many of them learned or powerful or godly, and not infrequently they have been the chosen servitors of the destinies. Yet what they do or know is always less than what they are. Once one of them appeared on the front page of the newspapers because he had climbed with amazing pluck and calculated foolhardiness a hitherto unconquered mountain peak, an Indian boy his only companion. But what we who loved him liked best to recall about that exploit is an inch cue of a book he carried along with him and read through for the hundredth time likely before the climb was completed. It was Hamlet. Another is immortal for cleansing the world of yellow fever, but the ignorant half-breeds among whom he worked remember him now only for his gentleness, his directness without bluntness, his courtesy which robbed obedience of all humiliation. Still others, I understand, have amassed fortunes and, to use a word much reverenced by my temporal co-tenants, succeeded. That success, I suspect, was in spite of their sojourn in our green woods. The Arcadians learn here, and that is why I'm having such difficulty telling you these things, the imponderables. Ears slightly more pointed and tawny-furred, a bit of leafiness somewhere in the eyes, a manner vaguely apriline. Such attributes, though unmistakable, are not to be described. When the Arcadians are fools, as they sometimes are, stupidity. And when they are brilliant, you do not resent their intellectuality. The reason is their manners. The kind not learned or instilled, but happening. The core being sweet. Are far realer than their other qualities. Socrates, and Jesus, and St. Francis, and Sir Philip Sidney, and Lovelace and Stevenson had charm. The Arcadians are of that lineage. What Pan and Dionysus and the old ladies dower them with is supplemented by an influence which must appear to the uninitiated incompatible. By the aid of a large bell jangled over their sleeping heads from the hands of a perambulating Negro, the Arcadians at seven each morning are driven not without maledictions to divine service. A minute before the chapel bell stops ringing, if you happen to be passing, you may imagine the building to be on fire, for young men are dashing to it from every corner of the campus, many struggling with a collar or tie, or tightening a belt in their urgent flight. But at the opening of the first hymn, you'll find them inside, seated in rows, as quiet as lovebirds on a perch. More quiet, in fact, as the service progresses, you might well mistake their vacuity for devotion, unless you happen to notice the more nocturnal souls here and there who, sagging decorously, have let the warm sleep in. Nevertheless, the Arcadians add to their list of benefactors those elderly gentlemen about King James who mistranslated certain Hebrew chronicles and poems into the most magnificent music the human tongue has ever syllabled. In their litanies, should be named no less those others, or were they the same, who wrote the Book of Common Prayer. Each morning these young men, here floating across their semi-consciousness, the sea surge of their own language at its most exalted, clean and thunderous and salty. 
Some of the wash of that stormy splendor lodges in their gay shallows, inevitably and eternally. Who could hear each morning that phrase, the beauty of holiness, without being beguiled into starrier austerities? If someone daily wished that the peace of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost might be always with you, could it help sobering and comforting you? even if God to you were only a gray-bearded old gentleman and the Holy Ghost a dove? Suppose you had never rambled from the divine path farther than the wild rose hedge along its border, still would not the tide of pity for the illness of things rise in your heart at hearing, We have wandered and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep? Lusty Juventus hereabout may reflect and forget that there was a modern spiciness in the domestic difficulties of David, but it treasures unforgettably. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, and he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Such glistening litter is responsible, perhaps, for the tremulous awe and reverence you find in the recesses of the Arcadian soul. At least you can find them if you are wary and part very gently the sun-spotted greenery of Pan. Girders and foundations are fine things and necessary, no doubt. It is stated on authority that the creaking old world would fly into bits without them. But after all, what I like best is a tower window. This hankering is an endless source of trouble to me, and I like to think to myself in defense that it comes from having lived too long among mountain folk. For they seem always to be leaning from the top of their tower, busy with idle things, watching the leaves shake in the sunlight, the clouds tumble their soundless bales of purple down the long slopes, the seasons eternally up to tricks of beauty, laughing at things that only distance and height reveal humor in, and talking, 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 the enchanting, unstained silver of their voices spilling over the bright branches down into the still and happy coves. Sometimes you of the valley may not recognize them, though without introduction they are known of each other. But if some evening a personable youth happens in on your hospitality, greets you with the not irreverent informality reserved for uncles, puts the dowager empress of Mozambique, your house guest, at her ease, flirts with your daughter, says grace before the evening meal with unsmiling piety, consumes every variety of food and drink set before him, specializing on hot biscuits, with unabashed gusto, leaves a wake of laughter whenever he dips into the conversation, pays special and apparently delighted attention to the grandmother on his left, enchants the serving maid with two bits and a smile, offers everyone a cigarette, affable under the general disapproval, sings without art a song without merit, <laughs> sits at last on the doorstep in the moonlight, utterly content with the dreamy air of the young Hermes, which only means the sense of impending adventure is about his hair like green leaves. And then, if that night you dream of a branch of crabapple blossoms dashed with rain, pursue that youth and entreat him kindly. He hails from Arcady. Here we conclude a reading from a wonderful autobiographical novel by William Alexander Percy, native of Mississippi, alumnus of the University of the South, who, in the ninth chapter of that book, wrote on Siwani, his alma mater, where he, in his own words, spent four shining years. This has been a presentation of the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. I'm Arthur Ben Chitty. Our signature is a strain from the Sewanee Alma Mater, played on the Leonidas Polk Memorial Carillon. <laughs>